I've been programming computers since 1961, when the computers were somewhat, sometimes had, met, had tubes in them and sometimes had relays. Um, it's been for a long time, and it's great fun. But anyway, I get to get this started. Uh, our first speaker is Mitch Wand, indeed, uh, the person, I suppose he was MIT class of 69. I was class of 68, undergraduate. Um, so we knew our, uh, each other even then. Uh, and uh, he's been doing all this wonderful work on, on the, the mathematical structure of, uh, of programming languages. I certainly read lots of nice papers by Mitchell. And I'd like you to start. Thank you. I get to press the magic button. Yeah, there's two magic buttons. There's two magic buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. Computers are no damn good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So how do we get this projector screen down? <laughs> Who knows how to put the screen down? The screen is down. The screen is down. I don't want to bring it down. It's good enough. Yeah, but that's got it. that mark on your It's a right. It's a right. That's fine. I've got to get the image out of there. I'll just go. Well. <laughs> Kind of hard to follow uh, Andy's wonderful uh, introduction, but I'll try. Um, it's really hard to believe that it's been uh, 31 years since Dan and I arrived here at Indiana in the fall of 1973. Um, and the 11 years that I spent here, uh, I think, were intellectually the best years of my life, certainly uh, were the formative years of my career. Um, I remember the first time I wrote an NSF proposal, and they said, what do you plan to do in three years? And I said, who knows what I'm going to be interested in in three years? And 30 years later, here we are. OK, so now that we have an image, Oh, do we have to pick it this dark? No, I mean, no, the other way. Let's, let's keep it a little lighter than that. Okay. The, the controls are actually on the podium. I see, that's too bright. That's, that's too, too bright. bright. You can turn around. You can work from the podium. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Take yep. N NPHD. <laughs> <laughs> turn on the projector. We have, we have this or that. All right. This is half. OK. Um, so uh, th this talk is entitled Relating Models of Backtracking, and it's a uh, joint work with my student uh, Dale Valencourt. Uh, but I chose this topic uh, really because it, has, it all started with Dan. Oh, well. So on a flashback, as long as we're doing history, uh, to the summer of 2002, fun, when uh, Dan sent me this really mysterious file. And I've got this really hairy macro. Can you help me debug it? Uh, and of course, it being Dan's code, there were no comments <laughs> and no types. <laughs> and there were all sorts of things that were macros that looked like procedures. And I, said, I looked at it for a while. And I said, oh, I see what you're doing here. It's just the backtracking monad. And then I started working on it. <laughs> I've been thinking about this. Um, well, yeah, it didn't work out quite the way I thought it was supposed to work. And so uh, this really 
um, revive the quest a question that I have been thinking about for a long time. So here's an outline, right? So we've got an introduction. Uh, we'll talk about why monadic semantics. We'll talk about two semantics for backtracking. We'll talk about relating those semantics and uh, a little bit about operational semantics, uh, time permitting. Okay. So here's the problem that I abstracted from uh, Dan's file. Uh, so let's imagine you have, uh, let's say, a simply typed lambda calculus, and you've got some constants, you've got some fixed points. Uh, most of all, you have backtracking. So you might write something like, well, the natural number starting from n consists of what are the possible answers to that? Well, n itself, or any answer from nats from n plus 1. And of course, then the natural numbers become all the natural numbers uh, starting from 0. Notice, by the way, that this is actually not prologue, and we'll talk more about that um, if we have time. Slow machine, slow. So here's the problem. If you want to think about backtracking models, there are basically two ways to think about backtracking. First, you could think about a backtracking program as producing a stream of answers. So fail would produce the empty stream, and then the value of that program, the result of that program before the natural numbers would be the stream consisting of 0, 1, 2, and so on. And that's a uh, very nice, very appealing, very intuitive model. On the other hand, as uh, those of us know who have thought about implementing these things, um, you might want to represent a backtracking computation as something, as a procedure that uh, consumes two continuations. Right. Can you see that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Right, a success continuation and a failure continuation, and fail invokes the failure continuation. So um, here, Nats is going to be a continue, going to take a success continuation and a failure continuation, and will send to the success continuation zero the first answer, and then a failure continuation, which is a thunk, that will uh, produce more answers if you ever want some. Okay. And I thought for a long time, well, I thought for a long time about the relationship between these two. Right? And if you go back and look at the papers uh, back in 1985, Phil Wadler published a paper called uh, Failure as a Sequence of Successes, which basically talked about the stream model. And then in SICP, um, Hal and Jerry actually, as I recall, managed to, to think about both models at once. Interesting bit of schizophrenia. Okay. Um, so the question that I had, being mathematically oriented, is um, do these models agree? And if so, in what sense? So uh, for example, if we take three, ignore the unit for a moment, in the stream model, the value of 3 is a single stream 3. In the continuation model, well, it's this um, funny function here that, sent, that sends 3 to its success continuation. Okay. And that's fine if you only have one answer. But now what happens if your computation actually produces more than one answer, or even infinitely many answers? Or, worse yet, what if you had a computation like this, one of these backtracking computations that actually was producing procedures rather than integers? Okay. Well, as it turned out, I've been wondering about this question off and on since uh, at least 1997. That's sort of the earliest record I could find of me uh, jumping up and down and trying to interest a graduate student in doing it. Uh, Alas, without success. Uh, so what I want to talk about today um, is an answer to this question. Uh, and it's, this actually turns out to be a hard question because there have been 
uh, a number of solutions proposed in the literature. Uh, they're all wrong, for one reason or another. Uh, and in the course of working on this, uh, I came up with a number of uh, solutions that were actually wrong. Uh, in one case, um, I was sufficiently confident in the solution that I sent it off to a conference and the, co and the program committee did me the great favor of rejecting the paper. It was when I went to go revise it for the next uh, conference, I discovered uh, bugs. Okay. So, we need to talk, do a little more history here. So I want to flash back to the 70s. Right, I should have worn some suitable shirt for that. Um, in the 70s, when people invented and worked, first worked with denotational semantics, we had a whole menagerie of semantics. right? And to just kind of home in on that question, um, let's think about the question, what is the denotation of the expression three? And there are lots of ways of writing down a denotation for that uh, expression, uh, depending largely on what else you had in your language. Okay, so if expressions in your language always evaluated to integers, then the answer was simple: three, which is uh, three as a member of a um, set of natural numbers. On the other hand, if your expressions could possibly fail to terminate, then of course a non-terminating expression doesn't denote any integer. So, oops. Uh, so then we say, well, we mean three, but we mean it as an element of n with bottom adjoined. Or it could be that your expressions might have side effects on some store. So then what you really mean is the meaning of three is a function that takes a store and returns the pair three and the store. Uh, so that whole thing is a function that takes a store and produces either a pair consisting of a natural number and a store or bottom. Or it could be that you've got call CC and other things in your language. So all of a sudden you've got continuation semantics and this, that, and the other thing. Three is a function that sends three. The expression three is a function that sends three to its continuation. Right. Well, the what else in question is effects. We didn't know that at the time, but that's uh, that was what we were dealing with in the seventies. In the eighties, people started to try to fix that problem. Right. So there was a lot of talk about what was called at the time modular denotational semantics. Uh, and the idea, the strategy was to introduce a meta-language that would somehow mask all those nasty domain theoretic and lattice theoretic details. So for example, Peter Moss's had this thing called action semantics. And then again, Dan enters the scene uh, early. Um, Dan and Will Klinger and I had a paper back in 1982 called uh, Semantic Algebras. And then uh, there was another phrase that I was using as early as 1984 called Concrete Semantics. But none of that stuff took off. Um, hard to say why. I have, I have ideas, but they're not important just in a moment. The turning point was in 1989 when Maji introduced the idea of monads. And Maji's brilliant idea was, don't worry so much about the domain theory. Let the domain theory vary. What we'll have is what he called the monadic meta-language which was very simple, unlike the things you, I was talking about in the previous slide, which were all very complicated things. Um, that was a simple language. It was a lambda calculus plus exactly two additional constant symbols. And it had an equational semantics. And the rule was 
any model that satisfied those equational semantics was okay. So you can put anything you like underneath it. And depending on what, you, what else you wanted to add, you could put different models underneath it. And indeed, uh, Maji showed that the interpretations were broad enough to capture all the effects that anybody could think of at that time. And if you wanted to pin down and say, well, I'm only interested in languages with at least these effects, then you could add more constants to the language. And more equations and what have you. So let me, how many of you guys know at least a little bit about the monadic meta language? Just to give you some idea here. <coughs> okay. So we'll do this uh, briefly. Right, so in the core uh, monadic meta language, you've got some types, you've got scalar types, you've got function types, and you have computation types, T alpha. And the important thing to note is that T alpha is an abstract type. Right, it's the type of computations that produce values of type alpha. And I don't know what that is in the meta language. And then different models of MML called models called a monad, uh, may interpret T alpha differently. Okay. And we have, there's the language, you've got the ordinary lambda calculus, plus you've got your two constants, unit and bind. Unit takes uh, a value of type alpha and produces a computation of type alpha. Intuitively, that's supposed to be the constant computation computation that does nothing but produce that value. That's why I said unit three on the preceding slides. And then there's bind, which is the guy who sequences computations. It says, well, give me a, okay. Oops. We'll keep there we go. It says, give me a computation of type beta, a computation that produces a beta, Give me a computation that, give me a function, a procedure that takes a beta and gives me back a computation of alpha, and it'll give you back a computation of alpha. What computation of alpha do you get? Well, it's the computation that will run this computation, take this value, and apply that function to it to produce a computation. And we have the famous or infamous monad laws, which you either know about or don't. You don't really need to understand these for the moment. Okay. So here's the big picture. My student made this. He called it the Teletubby slide. <laughs> so we have our object language, which was the kind of thing we saw um, on, the, on slide two or thereabouts. You have a translation from that into this moment into this monadic meta-language, which serve the same purpose as the meta-languages I uh, talked about earlier. And now our two models of backtracking are two monads, that say two interpretations of that monadic meta-language. And what we'd like to do is to figure out what, what we can say down here. That we, of course, we need some commuting diagrams. Okay, so let's see sort of how that looks. We have two new constants to add to our uh, meta-language. We have disjunction, takes the or of two computations. And we have fail, which produces a computation that produces no answers. Okay, and we have the translation of the object language to the monadic meta-language, which is the standard call by value translation um, into the monadic meta language. Nothing, nothing exciting there. But we have some new equations. All right. So it says uh, any computation M or fail is the same as M, and fail or M is the same as M. And of course, disjunction should be associative. And if you say, do one of these two guys and then this guy, that's the same as saying, do this guy and this guy, or this guy and this guy. And furthermore, 
uh, failure is contagious. If you say fail and then do something else, you failed. There's no recovery from failure except by disjunction. And well, that isn't quite complicated enough to be interesting. So we'll add some numbers and we'll add a fixed point operation. Okay. So here's the question again. Right. You got the stream model and the uh, continuation model. So here's the stream model in all its glory. We're going to interpret computations of type alpha as streams whose elements are of values of type alpha. So a stream is either we have no information at all, or here's a finite stream, here's an incomplete stream, and here's uh, an infinite stream. And of course, unit says produce a singleton. Bind says, given a stream and a function on streams, apply that function to each element of the stream. That gives you a stream of streams. So uh, then you flatten it to get it to single stream. Uh, disjunction is concatenation, and fail is empty. Here's the two continuation model. Well, let's see. Uh, in, a, in the continuation model, um, a computation of type alpha is a function that takes a success continuation and a failure computation and produces an answer. And a success continuation takes a value and another failure computation and produces a value. And unit and bind are exactly the same as they are in the ordinary continuation monad. Disjunction says to do the or of C or D, take a success continuation and a failure continuation. Do your computation C, the first, one, the first guy C, in the current success continuation, but with a failure computation that says, if that fails, try doing D in the current success and failure continuations. And last but not least, fail says, oh, go do the failure continuation. And there are even more models for this uh, for this um, monad. Well, won't mention those. So here's here's our question again. Well, what's the best work on this subject up to this point? Well, the best work on this subject up to this point was by Dandy Grobauer and Rieger in 2001. And they said, well, the you can think of the continuation value, that continuation, continuation oriented value as the fold of the stream. That is to say, if you take that If you take this continuation model and use cons for the success continuation and nil for the failure continuation, four, okay, you get the you get the stream back. Uh, that's sometimes called the church representation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, their result had some limits. It was only good for first order language without recursion. No higher order. No uh, infinite streams. Okay, so that's where we started, and we said, well, what we need is an induction hypothesis. If M is an arbitrary term of some type alpha, what can we say about its value in M S in S versus its value in K? And that relation may be different to different types. All right, we need a family of relations um, between the alpha values in the stream model and the values of type alpha in the continuation model. And we want those, those relations uh, to have the following properties. First of all, it ha they have to be well behaved at base type and at uh, type T nat, T of base type. That is to say, at base type, they ought to be, it ought, the relation ought to be the identity. And at T nat, it ought to be uh, the same as the simple case we had uh, before. All right. And of course we want to show that it works for any M. All right. And we don't really care what it is, what this relation is um, at fancy types. 
uh, so long as it has these properties. Now it turns out that there is a design recipe for this. It's called logical relations. And logical relations, um, the design recipe goes as follows. Start with a, with a uh, type lambda calculus with constants and let, let's choose two models of this, la of this, of this calculus. Uh, let's call them, for lack of any better ideas, S and K. And let's imagine that for each type alpha, there's a relationship between the values of type alpha in the one model and the values of type alpha in the other model. Notice this is the relation on values, not on terms. No syntax here. Any old family of relations will do, subject to two conditions. First of all, at a function type, the relation to values of function type must be related if and only if they map related values to related values. And furthermore, if you have constants in your language, the values of a constants had better be related. So there's actually a lot of design space here. And usually, of course, what you do is you define these relations by uh, induction on the type. And the fundamental theorem of logical relations says if you do this, then for any closed term, the values of the, the term will be related in the two models. And this recipe has many, many, many uses. So that was insight number one. Insight number two is that this church representation, we need a nice compact way of thinking about this church representation business. So if you take a look at the fold of the list alpha A1, A2 through AN, let's say that's lambda cal, kappa, lambda Z, K of A1 applied to K of A2, so on down to Kn of z. Well, you futz around just a little bit there. You say, oh, gee, that is lambda kappa, kappa of a1, composed with kappa of a2, composed with dot, 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 kappa of an. And that's nice. That's something that's easy to manipulate. OK, so here's our relation. Scalar types. Relation is going to be the identity. At function type, it's going to be what the theorem requires. At computation types, we're going to say, well, let's see if A1 and B1 are related, and AN through AN and BN are related, then the stream consisting of A1 through AN will be related to lambda kappa, kappa of B1 composed with kappa of B2, and so on. Okay. Speed it up. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And we have to worry about bottom, and we have to worry about these infinite guys, so we close it under omega chains. Right? And indeed, all this works for our backtracking uh, MML. We have, to, we have to check to see that the constants are related, but that's not hard. Okay. So, corollary. If M is a closed backtracking MML term of type T nat, then mk const nil equals ms. So what Don B. Grobauer and Rieger said was right. Okay. But for us, the theorem now works even when m contains higher order subterms or subterms that might have infinitely many values or Lord only knows what else. In fact, now it'll work for any object language that we can translate into this meta language. So that's cool. Right. That's 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 power that we gain by uh, working with this meta language. And there's operational semantics, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Right? So what do we do? Right? Our operational semantics, we implement this, we usually actually use the two continuation model. What we do is we take this and we, put, we factor this semantics through another language, a still simpler language called, which we call MPCF, for which we can uh, come up with an adequate operational semantics, which 
has nice properties and this, that, and the other thing. Right? We'll, we'll skip the details. There's the adequacy theorem for our little language. Um, it says if M is a closed PCF term, MPCF term of type stream of that, then if M denotes a stream whose first value is N, then the operational semantics will eventually reduce the term M to cons, constant of type N, M prime, where M prime is another um, term that denotes the rest of the stream. Okay. And it all fits together very nicely. And we were very careful to actually uh, make the theorems work together. Just <laughs> integration and systems integration is a problem even for mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, there's the conclusion, right? We had these two models of backtracking computation. Uh, we came up with a story that showed uh, how they agreed even at higher types and even for infinite values. Um, and in fact, even f this now works for any language uh, that you can translate into the backtracking meta language. So call, you want to call by value, call by name language, backtracking language, no problem, it still works. Thank you. <laughs> Dan has a large pile of paper on his desk, which will show you that the macro did eventually work. <laughs> Thank you.